Okay. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. Uh, that we had a very successful George Regas Courageous Peacemaker Award event on uh, September 10, uh, in honor of George uh, convening this group 22 years ago in the wake of 9-11. Uh, clips of that event will be made available on our website and elsewhere. Uh, and the time to contribute to the event is still open. Uh, we rely on the support of friends and strangers. Uh, when you got your invitation today, there's a link to make a donation. Uh, please be as generous as you can. And if you want to earmark it to the George Regas event, uh, that will help us meet our financial goals. We have a small partial paid staff, uh, but we want to keep the doors open. Uh, we've literally put on a thousand webinars uh, over those years on these Friday forums, and we want to continue to do that and other work as well. So thanks very much for your support. All right. So the next order of our enterprise is our reflection, and it's being done this morning by Steve. So Steve, take it away. Thanks, everybody. On May 10, 1933, the German Student Union organized a coordinated nationwide day of book burning to eradicate books incompatible with the Nazi ideology, including books by Jewish, half-Jewish, communist, socialist, anarchist, liberal, pacifist, and sexologist authors. It's especially appropriate to remember that terrible period now during Banned Books Week uh, and with our wonderful speaker today. But this is no ordinary Banned Book Week. In the past, we used to lament scattered examples of a few backwater libraries and prudish school boards that foolishly banned books like The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This year, to coincide with its nationwide commemoration of Banned Books Weeks, PEN America issued a startling new report entitled Banned in the USA, the Mounting Pressure to Censor. You'll hear all about that report later from Allison. The report concludes that, quote, the freedom to read is under assault in the United States, particularly in public schools, curtailing students' freedom to explore words, ideas, and books. I recently returned from a trip to Europe that included a stop in Bonn, Germany. Our local guide paused in front of the old city hall and drew our attention to the cobblestones under our feet we saw many plaques in the ground designed to look like the spines of the books that had been burned on that very day on May 10, 1933. And Rick has some slides of photographs I took that day and you will see uh, the authors uh, as Rick pans through these photographs, um, the names of the authors such as Jack London, Karl Marx, Andre Gide, Ernest Hemingway, and Sigmund Freud, among others. 90 years ago, it was not only fanatic brown-shirted lunatics who burned books, Students and professors from the nearby college eagerly scoured their shelves and dutifully brought offending books to add to the pile. On a previous trip to Germany, I stood in the Berlin Opera Platz and looked down through a small transparent platform into an underground space filled with white bookshelves all of them completely empty. An accompanying plaque bears the prophetic words written by German poet and writer Heinrich Heine, 
in 1821, quote, that was just a prelude. When they burn books, they will ultimately burn people as well. Heine's political radical views led to many of his works being banned by German authorities, including those in Bonn that day. He himself spent the last 25 years of his life as an expatriate in Paris. Instead of relics of a distant past, these displays in Bonn and Berlin and elsewhere are warnings about the ever-present risk of what oppressive governments and societies are capable of doing when they begin by banning books. We must heed these warnings and oppose the growing repressive acts of censorship that are regrettably spreading throughout the United States. My reflection today is an excerpt from a piece I wrote for Truth Dig, uh, published yesterday, which Rick has put in the chat, which expands on these themes and highlights the important work of uh, Penn. And uh, Rose, if I may ellipse into an introduction to our speaker. Sounds good. Uh, <laughs> Allison Lee, as you heard, is managing director of Penn here, uh, there in Los Angeles. She'll tell her more about herself, her path to coming to this work, uh, at which we've learned today uh, has been supported and shared by her wonderful husband, uh, Rabbi Ken Chasen, uh, who holds the seat of the beloved Rabbi Leonard Bierman of blessed memory, uh, who was so important to us, to the founding of this very organization, standing side by side with George Regis and Dr. Mayor Hatut and Jim Lawson. So uh, it is my personal pleasure to turn the program over to Allison Lee. Thank you, Steve. Um, just want to make sure everyone can hear me okay? Good. Okay. Yeah. So um, I so appreciate that framing and that reflection. As we exchanged yesterday and in emails, I too have, have sat, um, have stood at that spot in Berlin um, long before I ever uh, started working for Penn um, and reflected on, on that very, um, prophetic, um, you know, quote that, you know, that when they burn books, people are next, um, which is in part what calls me to that work. Um, I um, have worked my entire career with, for progressive social justice organizations um, here in Los Angeles and also in New York. Um, I'm so thrilled to be a part of the conversation today um, because of the longstanding um, relationship and friendship and the deep respect I have for all of you, but also for, um, you know, our founders of Blessed Memory, um, George Regis and, and Rabbi Leonard Bierman. Um, you know, Pen America in many ways stands for um, what, what this organization stands for, which is the importance of dialogue, the importance of an exchange of ideas um, in the pursuit of justice and in, in the pursuit of free expression because we believe that when um, ideas are shared, even ideas that challenge us and make us uncomfortable, um, we are not just better off as humans, but our society flourishes. So um, I'm happy to be with, uh, with you today. This is, um, as my sweater says, um, it is a banned book week. Um, it's uh, sad to think that, um, that banned books have become such an issue here in this country that we need a week. In fact, here at Penn, we're not just doing this first week um, in October, we're having events and programs throughout um, the entire month because the issue um, is so pressing. Um, a sad state for our country, um, but important for us to shine light on it. So I wanna start, if we can start Rick with the slide and I'll just tell you like when to move ahead if that's okay. Um, with just a little bit about Penn America um, and, and how Penn got started. Um, so let me just make sure, there we go. Okay, so 
I have picture and picture and picture. Let's make sure my tech is good and then we're ready to go. So um, Pan America, um, if you get to the next slide, um, I'll read a little bit from our charter. But Pan America was founded um, 100, just over 100 years ago um, by a group of writers um, in the 1920s, um, a, a group of writers and their supporters who were coming together because they recognized the importance of not just celebrating great works of literature, but the power of the written word to really change the world. And at that time, they were facing growing fascism. Um, at that time, they were seeing the work of authoritarian regimes and what they were doing to suppress creatives. Um, and they had that understanding that um, often on the first lines, um, when an authoritarian regime is coming um, and fascism is growing, it is the writers, it is the artists, it is the journalists um, who are attacked. And we see echoes of that today, um, not just in our country, but worldwide. So um, Penn was founded um, in the 1920s to resist that, to bring writers together to resist the rise in fascism. Um, and there are pens across the world. There are, there are pen chapters across the world. Um, there is a pen Palestine and a pen Israel. There is a pen Ukraine and a pen Russia. And um, pens throughout in every country um, who really come together um, and, and bring the power of, of writers to just organize themselves um, to celebrate their work, um, but also to create dialogue, um, to, to create dialogue across cultures and across belief systems. So the PEN, Pen America, the charter that all of our work is organized in from uh, 1948, um, members of Penn uh, pledge themselves to do their utmost to dispel all hatreds and to champion the ideal of one humanity living in peace and equality in the world. Um, we stand for the unhampered transmission of thought within each nation and between all nations. And members of Penn pledge themselves to oppose any form of suppression of freedom of expression um, in the country and the community in which they belong. It's interesting, and we'll get into that a little bit um, more uh, a bit later in my presentation, but um, you know, that is actually a really difficult place to be in today. Um, standing for the principle of free expression in some ways can be very difficult. Um, it means standing for, you know, for me, the idea of free expression, when I read that part of the, ch of the charter, what it means I stand for is not just sitting in rooms with people who talk about things that I agree with, but allowing for the expression of the thing that I cannot stand the most, right? The thing that, that, that discomforts me, the thing that challenges my belief, the thing that might actually challenge my identity as a, as a woman, as a Jewish person, but, but my commitment to free expression says they have their right to express those point of views as much as I have my right to express my point of view. And if I am a real advocate for free expression, if I am a real advocate for the unhampered transmission of thought, that I need to stand up for that right. That is not um, such a popular view um, in, in 2023. Um, and that is something that's not popular actually on all sides of the political spectrum. Um, you know, um, a lot of uh, conversation um, that we encounter is conversation around, you know, the difference between hate speech and free expression. There is a tension there. Um, but hate speech is narrowly defined and well defined um, in in um, our legal literature. And so it's not necessarily something that just makes you uncomfortable. It's not necessarily something that you find discomforting. And so standing for, so I'll say Pen America, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but Pen America obviously is on the front lines of the fight against book bans. Our opponent on the other side in many, of the, in many of the communities in which we work is an organization called Moms for Liberty. Moms for Liberty has been identified as a hate group um, in this country. We do not stand for, we are in direct opposition to everything that Moms for Liberty stands for, and we will continue to advocate against them. There were calls recently to cancel a um, conference that Moms for Liberty was holding in in Philadelphia and Penn came out with a statement that said, you should not cancel 
they're they have the right to convene. They have a right to get. To, they have the right. The, the the museum should not cancel that conference. We can protest that conference. We can raise our voice up in opposition, but we do not believe in canceling. So that's the the interesting tension of that part of our charter. Um, and then finally, and most importantly, um, you know, Penn stands for free press that opposes arbitrary censorship. Um, and, um, you know, at the time in 1948, the issues were mendacious publication, deliberate falsehood and distortion of facts for political and personal ends. Um, you know, it's a little bit of everything old is new again. Um, you know, I don't think the founders of, of this, the writers of this charter in 1948 um, could have anticipated um, that we would be living now in 2023 in a period of time where misinformation and disinformation and alternative facts um, um, were so prevalent and that it was in the, and that it would be so difficult actually um, for the consumers of, of media to determine what is truth um, and what is real um, with the advent of AI and, um, and, and, and the internet and everything else. But um, you know, it, it, it really is core to who we are um, and is a significant part of our work. So that is the basis of where we came from. Um, Rick, if you wanna to get to the next slide, it'll show a video um, real quick. That'll just kind of be an overview. Words have power, and it is in fact because of their power that we must protect them. Over the past 100 years, PEN America has become an international force, advocating for free expression, defending writers and artists at risk around the globe, and fighting censorship here and abroad. Hitler burnt books and used a phrase that's very interesting. He said, um, we have to get rid of the artistic criminal. I think we should throw these books in the fire. It's not a quote from Fahrenheit 451. It's a quote from a school board member last year in Virginia. Across the country, book bans have taken school districts by storm. And this is just one thread in a larger web of educational censorship that is entangling our schools, our colleges, our libraries. As an advocate who has championed stalwart US leadership on free speech issues worldwide, I barely recognize my own country. But at root, one is only as free as one's willingness to suffer the consequence of exercising that freedom. Which is why writers like Rushdie and Sara Wiwa and Solzhenitsyn and Taslima Nasreen and Liu Xiaobo and Ruben Salazar and so many others like them, past, present and future, it's why writers like this are so inspiring to us. Their courage gives us strength. Our small delegation is trying to tell our colleagues here, Ukrainian writers, that they are not alone, they are not forgotten. Our words remain at risk. Our books remain at risk. Our lives remain at risk. PEN America is building networks across the country of advocates and literary leaders of all ages to make their voices heard, whether they are writers in prisons or students on campuses or journalists fighting disinformation and online harassment. Pen America's work, Pen America's existence is in many ways an assurance that writers all over the world can, perhaps even should, dare to speak. At Pen America, we are fighting for free expression in all its forms. Writing, film, theater, art, music, research, digital activism, and journalism. Because creativity freely expressed transcends borders and drives our curiosity. It's how we share experiences, tell stories, and understand others. Free expression is the lifeblood of our freedom and humanity. It's what unites us. For Penn as an organization, uh, it should be heartening to realize that it turns out uh, the pen is mightier than the sword. The stories we tell are powerful. 
Pen America, championing the freedom to write for more than 100 years. With you, we're ready for the next century. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So the next slide, um, there's so many, first of all, there's so much in there to unpack. Um, you know, um, I'd like to just kind of pull a couple of different things. Um, one, you saw Salman Rushdie um, in, in the, um, in, in the video, um, Salman is a former uh, president of Pan America. Um, and I was taking note um, in the opening, um, he helped found our World Voices Festival in the wake of 9-11. And, you know, just like this gathering and this organization was a reaction um, to 9-11 and, and, and a call um, to of the importance of dialogue and community and organizing um, across religions, across cultural identities. Um, the creation of the Penn World Voices Festival, which has events, it'll take place in May, um, has events both here in Los Angeles and also in New York, um, is a three or four day festival um, that um, brings writers together from around the world um, because it valued the same thing, the importance of dialogue, the importance of sharing of ideas, the importance and, and the role liter literature um, can, can play um, in dispelling common myths and misunderstandings that often so um, many um, of our hatreds and many of our, um, you know, kind of knee jerk reactions. Um, the idea is that if you know someone and you can know someone through a book, if you know their story through a book, um, that um, you can, you know, that has the ability to really change hearts and minds. So that was one. Um, I don't know if you saw, we'll get into it in a little bit, but um, Nargis Mohammadi uh, this morning was named, or late last night, I guess, um, was named the um, winner of the Nobel Prize for Peace. Um, and Nargis has been imprisoned um, in jail in Iran. She is a human rights um, advocate, attorney, and, and writer. Um, she has been imprisoned for um, for many times in and out of prison. Uh, she was the Pan America uh, Freedom to Write awardee at our gala um, in New York in May. Um, and in part, and really represents a lot of what we do with our Freedom to Write Center in terms of shining a light in all of the dark corners of dissidents who are being silenced. Um, and so we're, you know, just just to see her face up there and to know that, you know, that work is being recognized on the widest global scale it possibly can, um, you know, is really, you know, quite remarkable. Um, and then we get to the book burning here, um, you know, the book banning here um, in this country. So real quickly, Pan Amer our, our mission statement is uh, Pan America stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect free expression in the United States and worldwide. Uh, we champion the freedom to write, recognizing the power of the word to transform the world. Our mission is to unite writers and their allies to celebrate creative expression and to defend the liberties that make it possible. Uh, last night, we had a reading um, by uh, Viet Than uh, Nguyen. Uh, a writer from San Jose who writes about his experience as a Vietnam uh, refugee, um, an immigrant to this country. And I couldn't think of a more powerful, by the way, this is his, his newest book right here. I just wonder, I'll give him a plug, um, A Man of Two Faces. Um, I had the opportunity to hear from it last night. Um, but, you know, it was just really a great um, kind of amalgam of um, what we do, which is we are celebrating a new piece of literature, but we're also convening people to have the conversations of what does it mean to be an immigrant in this country? What does it mean to be a refugee in this country? What does it mean to be the child um, of immigrants who have faced you know, trauma and that inherited trauma? And how in the sharing of those stories, um, do others come together and identify their own, their own trauma? So um, just want to kind of give that little plug. Um, so I think we know the next slide is about um, why free speech matters. Um, I'm gonna, um, so I'm gonna just tell you my, my story. So um, as I said at the beginning, um, 
I've worked in social change organizations my entire career. I'm married to a rabbi. Um, I'm obviously deeply, um, both personally and professionally engaged in this um, idea and this obligation that I feel that I have to repair the world, the Jewish principle of tikkun olam, um, and that I am a partner um, in, in that work, in that work in and of itself is holy. Um, I come to it honestly. I, and I come to this work, um, honestly, I do see it not just because of the work that I've done with international human rights in terms of what happens to journalists, um, what happens to artists, um, in countries where there's not a thriving democracy, but, um, you know, I, I think about it often. Um, and I know the, this will this will um, speak to my father. It was his father um, who um, once told me um, he was the son of immigrants and the first uh, to be born in this country. And he was the one who told me that more the most important document he ever received, the most important license he ever received, was not his driver's license and not his passport, which allowed him to travel the world, and not even his license to be a pharmacist, which was his profession. But the most important document he ever received was his library card when he was a young boy, because it was in the going to a library that he opened his mind to the possibility of what his world could be, what the world of his children and his grandchildren could be. It's where he encountered others and he grew in empathy and in understanding and curiosity and um you know that always struck me i was a library nerd of a kid when i was young i was the one who you know when the libraries did the summer reading competitions you know the only i was not really good at the athletic competitions but put me on a summer reading reading list competition and man did i win the most books read you know in the course of a summer i don't know what awards you got for that, but that that was, you know, I still can remember the sights and the smells and the sounds of my local public library, Bottom Branch Library in, in the suburbs of Cincinnati, Ohio. And, um, and also for me, I had that experience in which I was a child who didn't necessarily see themselves in the community in which I was living, but I found myself um, in the stories of others, often stories of other people that were not at all similar to me, but somehow we had that connective tissue. And so that's why I think that free speech matters. Um, I don't just think that it matters because it's the it's a human right, which it is, or that it's the law of the land, which it is, but it is, or that it's whole, democratic and we hold governments accountable for, you know, with it. Um, it is really, for me, at its core, the humanistic um, aspect of why free speech matters. It is the human need to both express ourselves and to connect to others. And so, um, you know, I know for me, that's why this work um, matters so much. So um, I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about the pen about our free expression programs. Um, Pen America, generally speaking, just so you know, has both literary programs and free expression programs. So we do the literary work to celebrate. That's the aspect of our mission. That's to celebrate writers and readers, um, like the event we did last night. I encourage you to go to our website. We have events um, throughout Los Angeles. We have um, an event next Monday with Justin Torres at Skylight Books and Sophia Sinclair at Reparation Club uh, next Friday night. Um, and then, um, so we do a lot of that work. We also do a lot of work with uh, writers who are, um, usually from communities um, that are not always encouraged in traditional literature, do not always have pathways to traditional literature. So we do a lot of work with young writers and emerging writers um, to encourage distinct voices um, in our literary canon, because we understand that representation matters um, and that the diversity of ideas in literature matters. So we do that work. And then what I want to talk to you about is our free expression program. And that's really where the book banning work comes in, is our, is our free expression program in which we champion the freedom to write, read, and learn. Um, so the next slide is our free expression work. Um, and that's just an overview. You can go, although I love the Audre Lorde um, quote, we can go on to the next slide after that. Um, 
And we do that work through advocacy and policy. Um, so that is our work at the high level, both in Washington, D.C., um, at the U.N., um, and then also locally. So, um, you know, it'll go everything from a national policy on book banning or a national policy around AI and tech. At the international level, we talked a, lot, a little bit about, we do a World Congress um, uh, which convenes writers. We did a World Congress in May of 2022 to bring Ukrainian writers together at the UN and writers around the world to talk about um, the escalating crisis in, in Ukraine at the time. Um, we'll do another such convening next May. Um, but then also here locally. And I think a lot of people think, well, we're in California, uh, blue California. <laughs> it's not an issue. Um, free expression issues are hyper, hyper local. And Book banning in particular are, is a hyper, hyper local issue. So even though we have a governor who just enacted the second um, piece of legislation in the country um, to ban book banning in this country, the first was Governor Pritzker in Illinois, um, Newsom's bill AB 1078 just passed, it was signed into law last week, um, that um, bans book banning in California. Um, we'll see all sorts of local efforts to um, um, to kind of loophole or get around that. In fact, just this week, um, the superintendent of the Escondido Union School District in Escondido, California, a little further south from Los Angeles, um, uh, closed all, I'm just trying to imagine this, closed all the libraries in the school district for an audit um, because he said there was one challenge of one book in the library that was sexually explicit. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a um, note here. Nor if you ever read about books being challenged by parents as being sexually explicit, or you read about what happened in Huntington Beach, um, where the city council actually called for a review of all of the books in the Huntington Beach Public Library because of pornographic material. Um, for the book banners, um, sexually explicit or pornographic material is typically, not, almost always, um, code for books that are dealing with LGBTQ issues. So they are finding that books that are dealing with um, memoirs about um, LGBTQ experiences, uh, books that that touch on LGBTQ themes, including you know sexual identity. Um, will be tagged as um, sexually explicit or pornographic. To be clear, there are clear laws about what is pornographic. There is no library in the country that has pornography as defined by the Miller test in their libraries. That would be illegal. Um, so just from an from a advocacy and policy standpoint, we do a lot of work to clarify uh, when, when challenges like that come along, what is the law and what is, what is not. We also, um, in Florida, where 40, our, 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 um, our research report that was um, published you know, just this week um, indicated 40% of all book bans in the United States are happening in Florida. Um, and it is largely now not just this, like, it's not even a individual person or a group. It is now being supported by legislation, um, in Florida. You've probably heard of the, you know, don't say gay law and the, you know, the, the, the laws that prohibit the conversations about race or identity or gender, um, in school curriculums. Um, so in Florida, one of the pieces of policy and advocacy we've done is um, we're actually suing the school board of Escambia County, Florida. We've come together with both writers, publishers, par parents, and teachers um, to, um, to sue the school board in terms of um, due process being um, violated there. So that's a bit of our work there. Um, as I mentioned with Nargis, we do protection and emergency response. We have a writers at risk program, an artists at risk program um, in which writers or artists that are being threatened um, will provide both emergency support, emergency funds um, for them. 
Um, we do a ton of research. Uh, the, the research that we're talking about today happens to be around um, banned books, but um, we've also just recently done research on AI, on, um, on online harassment, um, on issues um, of um, social media in terms of what gets reported and what doesn't get reported. Um, so I encourage you to kind of um, check that out. Um, and then we're constantly, you know, trying to be a voice in the conversation through blog posts, op-eds, uh, and, and media. So, um, and then we do a ton of um, programming. So one of the things that might be of interest for you, for your own communities, um, just this, in the last week, we've done four trainings of what we call our next gen pen program, which is really trying to change, trying to train the next generation of free expression advocates, high school and college students. Um, we'll go, we were at Pasadena City College. Uh, we were down at UCSD. Uh, we are at New Road School in Santa Monica. Uh, we were in Huntington Beach. We'll be at UCI, Ir it will be at UC Irving. Uh, in a week, um, and we do a series of trainings for young people who um, want to understand issues of free expression and want to be well-informed advocates. So if you have youth in your community that you would like to get involved, please be in touch, and I'm happy to put them in touch with our program manager here. It's really a great program. Um, I just saw yesterday a group of high schoolers from the LA area got together and they created, you can look them up on, on Instagram or wherever, um, they're calling themselves the Golden State Readers. And they're doing just that great work that we know makes such a difference, that like real grassroots organizing work, where this week what they've decided to do is they're putting caution tape around their backpacks and they're bringing their backpacks to school to engage people in the conversation of what happened happens when books are, are taken away or ideas are censored. Uh, they're raising money um, to um, be able to purchase books to deliver them to high school students um, in communities like Tulsa, Oklahoma, and in Texas and in Florida, um, whose books have been taken off the library shelves. Um, and I just really applaud that kind of next generation of creative, thoughtful, um, passionate um, advocacy. So that is um, a bit of what we uh, do. Um, the next slide uh, digs a little bit into this issue around book banning. So this is information from our um, latest report. Um, Pan America has been tracking book bans um, since July 1st, 2021. And um, I wanna be super clear about how we define a ban. Because if you go out in the community and you start talking about book banning, people will say, but they're not being burned, right? They're not being taken off the shelves entirely. I can still purchase that book on Amazon. So it's not really banned. And um, Pen America defines a book ban quite simply as any, um, any book that was widely available in a, in a library, in a school library or a public library that was put on the shelves at the determination of um, educators and media specialists um, as age appropriate and necessary for the learning and engagement of young people. So any book that was widely available that is somehow restricted in some way. So it could either be a wholesale taken off the shelves entirely it could be removed pending re pending review. One of the things that we're finding a lot of is that um, because school boards don't necessarily have their process in place of what to do. Uh, in Beaufort, South Carolina, for instance, um, one person challenged 194 books and they are all removed from the shelves pending review. That pending review has been over a year. So that to us is a ban. There are students who are no longer able to access that and no one knows when they will get those books back or how they will get those books back. So that to Pen America is a ban. Um, the other would be a restriction of the book, a previously widely available book that is now restricted in some way. So it's been moved to a higher shelf. It's been moved to a different section of the library. It's been pulled off the shelf of general circulation and now either a student needs to pass a reading test or a parent needs to sign a note or something like that. 
um, in order for the student to access that. Um, a great example of that would be Amanda Gorman's uh, The Hill We Climb. Her book was challenged by one parent uh, in Miami Lakes, Florida. By the way, if you look at the challenge, the parent didn't even, the parent wrote that Oprah, like the handwritten little challenge is that Oprah wrote the book. Oprah did not write the book. Oprah wrote the intro. Um, and it said the reason why they were challenged, this is not even a parent who, um, it's, uh, sorry, it's not even an individual who's a parent in the school district. She did, she has no children in the district. And um, it was later found that she has um, very, uh, very um, specific online comments against Jews and is a um, is connected to the Proud Boys. So she's got a great pedigree, uh, but she challenged this book. Um, and through that one challenge, uh, the book, which is, if you've read it or you heard it at inauguration, there is really nothing offensive about this book, but she said it was indoctrination and it was meant for children. And it was, um, it's now been removed from the shelves um, for, for someone to access it. They have to demonstrate that they have above a sixth grade level reading. They have to pass a reading test. They have to have a parent sign for it just to read the Hill, Hill Week line. So that to us would be a ban. So that just straight definition there. Um, needless to say, the instances in book banning are exponentially growing. Um, you know, 2021, 2,532. 3,362 uh, in, in this last school year. Um, you know, prior to that, we're talking about a handful of books being banned every now and then. As Steve said, it was not something that we really needed to contend with. Um, it's important to note that the subject matter of, of books that are being banned, it's really issues of themes of violence or, or, or physical abuse. Uh, many times um, that is um, sexual violence and sexual abuse, um, often YA novels designed for young women to understand stories that are designed to empower young women to understand what their rights are. Those issues are being banned. Um, uh, characters of color or themes of race and racism. So that is as simple, I mean, that is everything from to everything Toni Morrison has ever written from uh, Beloved to The Bluest Eye to Song of Solomon um, to Huck Finn to To Kill a Mockingbird. But also, to be honest, it is uh, Ruby Bridges, the story of Ruby Bridges, which has been made into a children's book um, that is being banned. Um, LGBTQ characters or themes, um, that is a, that is a uh, big uh, topic. Um, and those are a lot of stories written by authors who are really trying to make sure that students feel seen and heard. And oftentimes young people who are struggling with their own issues of identity um, and don't have anywhere else to go have a book to turn to because they themselves didn't have anywhere else to go and wished they had had a book to turn to. Um, and, um, you know, to us, that is one of the most um, shocking and kind of um, important um, issues for us to kind of shine a light on. And that, um, you know, these writers, uh, students are often asked who's the most trusted person in their school. And they'll say their school librarian because they can go to their librarian to ask a question. Their librarian can say, well, why don't you read this book? And it's, it's, it's comfortable and it's, it's um, somewhat anonymous and they can just read a book and they don't have to, you know, they can encounter it one-on-one. -on -one. And to think of those um, books being pulled off the shelves and those students not having access to those stories um, is, is frightening. And very much the fact that they're using pornography and sexually explicit material um, to challenge that um, is, um, is, is really gets to the essence of actually what they're afraid of. And then uh, we'll keep, we'll, we'll go down, but I think one of the two things that we, we, um, track this year that is really disconcerting is um, topics of on health and um, well-being of students. So that's mental health issues, students who are contemplating self-harm or, um, or suicide um, to not be able to read or to, to understand, to read a story of someone who also encountered those feelings and lived through it. Um, those books are being um, pulled and themes of grief and death 
this idea of, you know, not having those stories available. Um, not listed here, but important to note, um, in the last year, we tracked 41 instances of books with Jewish characters and themes that have been banned. That's everything from um, Art Spiegelman's Mouse um, to the graphic novel of The Diary of Anne Frank. Um, and at least 57 instances of Muslim characters and themes being banned. Um, so that kind of lets you know actually what's at the heart of um, what they're trying to take off the shelves um, in this effort. Uh, the next slide will give you a sense of where school bans are happening state by state. It is not necessarily surprising, as I indicated, 40% of all the bans in the country are happening in Florida. Texas um, is not far behind. Um, we have issues in Utah. Uh, we have issues, a lot of issues in Missouri. Um, and, um, but it is important to note that, you know, California is not in the gray with zero bans. Um, you know, we, we have our own issues with local school boards, both in Orange County, the South Bay, but also right here in Los Angeles, um, you know, Santa Clarita um, School District pulled Gender Queer, which is one of the top um, banned books that we've tracked um, off the shelves for a uh, uh, conversation. Uh, we had issues at the uh, Satakoy School around issues around pride. I mentioned uh, Escondido, Huntington Beach, Temecula. School district pulled um, an entire textbook, a social studies textbook. I don't know if you read about this one, but they pulled a social studies textbook because there was a biography, um, a conversation about Harvey Milk um, in the um, textbook as a California leader for civil rights. And um, the entire textbook was pulled because of that mention. So uh, we're curious and looking forward to seeing what happens with Newsom's uh, bill um, as a result, co clearly he's trying to get us to that gray, um, but but we are not there yet. So the next slide is the most banned books of the 2022-2023 school year by district. Um, so you can kind of see a little bit of what I was just talking about. All of those issues are there, right? The bluest eye is race and racism, looking for Alaska, mental health, sexual violence, um, gender queers, LGBTQ issues, uh, the perks of being a wallflower is also mental health, as is 13 Reasons Why. Um, I encourage you to look and find all these books and read them for yourselves. Um, to me, these are all books that, um, that mostly in YA, by the way, the most banned books are YA and, and picture books, but there are children's picture books that are being banned. There's um, a book called Entango Makes Three, which is a children's picture book about, a, it's a true story of two male penguins in the Central Park uh, Zoo who adopted and raised an egg on their own. And this book was banned. <laughs> so, um, you know, I guess, I guess two male partner uh, penguins are, are threatening. So, um, <laughs> but YA and young adult books are, um, right, if it wasn't so scary, it would be very funny. But, um, but they are the most banned books. Um, I've now read a lot of them. And to me, what I feel like they're banning is this, um, you know, YA books are designed in, intentionally to create a feeling of empathy and connection it is when young people are learning to um, push outside the boundaries of their own home um, to encounter stories that are different than their own and to grow and both in their self-identity, but their understanding of who they are as a human connected to others. And any attempt to kind of cancel those stories um, will cancel the next generation of, of individuals who have not just intellectual curiosity, but, um, but human curiosity. And, you know, again, to me, that is um, what is what is what is what is scary. So um, I don't know how much. So we're almost done. The next slide is we are doing this week. We have an action that you can, if you go to pen.org, 
forward slash action, you can get to all of our banned book week actions. Uh, we are partnering with We Believe um, to do a day of action tomorrow, October 7th. Um, so I encourage you to go to our website and sign on to our joint statement. Um, it's pretty simple. We believe in the freedom to read. We believe stories matter. We believe in the freedom to learn. We believe that all students should feel valued in the classroom. We believe that teachers and librarians deserve respect. Um, you know, for teachers and librarians to be um, on the front lines of this fight, um, for them, I mean, we do um, um, trainings, online harassment trainings for, we used to just do them for journalists. Now we're doing them for writers, for teachers and librarians who are finding their personal information being, you know, this doxing that happens being put online and their homes are being, you know, people are calling librarians pornographers or groomers. Um, and, um, you know, it's just people are leaving the profession uh, teachers in Florida, librarians in Florida fear for what they can teach and if they would, you know, might be imprisoned for it because of new state laws. Um, and we want to bring that respect back to teachers and librarians. And I don't think it is, I mean, I think it is definitely, we shouldn't under, you know, we shouldn't undervalue the fact that this, this effort is an effort to undermine public trust and two institutions, public school, and libraries that are perhaps the most democratic institutions, democratic with a small d, in our country, right? These are institutions that everyone, regardless of your status, can enter into. If you think about a library, you think about my grandfather's story, I'm sure all of you have stories that, that immigrants, that people are learning, you know, at our libraries today, people are learning English as a second language. You're getting continuing education. You're able to access computers that can help you access what your social services are. Um, our unhoused neighbors have the ability to go into libraries and to have a moment of respite and also a moment to connect with services, mental health there. So this idea of undermining public trust in libraries and librarians, in teachers and schools is part of an over, you know, an overarching um, a strategy to undermine the things that bring those of us who are most at risk um the most power and so i think you know we need to make note of that um we believe that part parents are partners in education um the framing of this being a parents rights issue on the other side um i do think it's a parents rights issue what i think it is is that n one parent cannot decide for another parent what is appropriate each parent has the ability to decide what they want to read with their children and what they want their children to be reading and we encourage reading between parents and children. We encourage the sharing of ideas. We encourage the conversation, but we do not believe what we're seeing, which is, you know, uh, 10 or 11% of, um, you know, 10 or 11 people are, you know, or organizations are fueling all of the book banning. And so these one, you know, these, these single voices in communities are making decisions for all. Um, and we believe in clear, consistent, and transparent policy around reviewing books. We just issued a statement yesterday about Escondido. Um, this, the superintendent is declining to tell the public what title he is saying was in sexually inappropriate. Um, he, is, he, is, he is refusing to say why all the libraries were closed to do this audit when their own stated school, school board policy says that this is not how they would go about review. So I encourage you to add your voice um, you know, to to the advocacy there to call for clear, consistent and transparent parent policies around um, reviewing books. So what you can do on the next slide, you can join our campaign, you can sign on, um, you can sign up um, for the Los Angeles newsletter to find out what you can do to get involved here in California, but also around the country. Um, you can share, there's online, if you go online, you can share our social media graphics um, to help spread the word um, and, um, you know, and to spread this out to your communities as well. So um, before I close for questions, I just want to um, share Amanda Gorman's quote um, from the book that was, that was banned. Um, you know, together, this is a hill we won't just climb, but a hill we will conquer. Um, 
this work can be um, very hard. All of us are engaged in work that can be very hard. Um, but I think we've each discovered um, inspiration in both the collective power of those who raise their voices in, in opposition to um, the voices that want to silence, um, but also in the inspiration that we get from from the writers and the stories that we share. So thank you so much um, for having me and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Steve, you have your hand up. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful presentation, Allison. Thank you so much. Uh, I learned so much from this. I thought the group might appreciate your dig deeping dig deeper into this uh, very important lawsuit that Penn has brought uh, against the Escambia, Florida school district, because both the plaintiffs in the case that you've gathered, uh, I think is an important coalition of voices uh, and the underlying issues and some of the details in the lawsuit itself. So uh, why don't you elaborate on that? Sure. So um, Escambita County is a county in Florida. Um, we made the decision that, as as we've often found in other, um, you know, as we've often found in other um, issues, that while you are organizing on the ground and you are trying to help people on the ground respond to a crisis, that um, certainly in Florida. Um, we weren't going to get anywhere in the legislature. So one of the things that we could do is we could try a, a legal approach, litigation. Um, that litigation is different than other. Um, so you might see some litigation that brings some authors together, but this is the first and to date only litigation of its kind that are bringing together plaintiffs, as I mentioned briefly, and I'll go into it, that are Pan America as an organization, a membership organization of 7,000 writers, Penguin Random House, which a number of the books that are being banned are uh, Penguin Random House is the publisher. Parents in the school district who are suing on behalf of their children. Writers whose books have been banned who are suing on behalf of their livelihoods being um, um, impacted. And educators, teachers in the school district who say that their, their First Amendment rights for free speech are being violated. So this is a, a multi-pronged um, piece of litigation that has both First Amendment, 14th Amendment, and even Ninth Amendment um, challenges in it, um, in that we're saying that it's identity issues, it's education issues. We're just kind of, you know, for lack, it's, this is not, I am not an attorney, so this is not the legal term for it, but we're, you know, what is it? We're throwing the kitchen sink. We're putting it all out there and we're going to see what sticks. I mean, it's a little, a little bit, I know my, my attorney colleagues would be terrified that this is what I'm saying, but it is a little bit of like, let's see what sticks in, in the case so that, because we know this isn't just a case. This is one of those cases that gets filed. That's not really for the first round. It's really for the circuit. It's really for the, when we get to the circuit level, when we started challenging it there. So that's, that is the process in Escambita. We are, um, looking for similar school districts, similar similar cases. We're really looking for one in the ninth district um, because we really want to elevate this conversation um, to the federal level. So, but you can also read about it. It's, it, yeah, it's on the Penn website if you wanna dig a little bit deeper and actually see the, for those of you who have a legal leaning to, to read the filing so that you can have more, um, a more legal background than the throwing the kitchen sink at it, which is definitely not a legal term. So, yeah. If I can do a quick follow up, I gather the case yeah. was filed in May. Uh, has there been a, and now I'm asking you to delve into the legal side, yeah. but has there been a motion to dismiss? Has the there, court made any rulings? Is, there has been no rulings from the court, but there has also not been a motion to dismiss, which is great. So it's still, working its way through the system. So, thank, yeah. Thank you. But nothing has been set yet, but no motion to dismiss, which is important. And I wanna say, um, you know, the um, from on, on the federal level, this policy gets set by um, the Education Department Office for Civil Rights. Um, and um, 
they, we have had conversations with them about um, what can be done. Um, they wrote a letter to, you know, they, they got a school board in Georgia to kind of back away from what they were doing because they were claiming you were going to violate the civil rights of your students if you do this. And um, when we had those conversations, you know, this is a um, this is a team that was radically defunded in the Trump administration. They have a, a serious lack of investigators, but they will investigate any claim of a student's rights being violated. And we got a little bit of a you know wink and a nod of like file claims wherever you can find them, file claims, and then we are required by law to follow up on them. So that is another strategy we are exploring. Would you mention Matt Nosingchuk? Uh, the czar of against book banning? Yes, for those of you who don't know, the Biden administration appointed the first czar against book banning who sits in that office. Um, it, he, he, Matt just started. He's a friend of the organization and we're very excited to see what happens next. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are three hands up right now and the order in which I can see them, Phil, yeah, I, um, it's kind of a personal question in a way. I'm at that stage of my life where I'm weaning out the my possessions. Uh, mm -hmm. And many of my treasured possessions are books. Um, and uh, I've always kind of kept my books as, as a... Um, what, what do I mean? A, uh, a a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. uh, people see my. I books don't know what you're talking about because I, I, I might be among you. All right. Yeah. Uh, I don't need that anymore. Um, what I want to do is put them, give them, distribute them in some way uh, that is uh, useful and appropriate, and yeah. and make them available. Um, and I could do private book sales in my religious community or whatever, but but what would you recommend? Is there places to send books that are banned or potentially banned? Yeah, so I actually went through our bookshelves this summer and did a little bit of uh, weaning. I don't think you can tell by my bookshelves that I did a little bit of weaning, but I actually did. And it is actually, um, it, I, I so, feel what you're saying because um it's very actually it's, it feels much harder than it should be to be able to find um a, a good home to rehome books um but it is much harder than it should be a lot of libraries don't accept you know you should go to your public library because your public library might accept the books if not for them their own shelves but um, a lot of libraries do book sales and the benefits of those those book sales you know the funds that they raise benefit the library so i would look there um i'm I don't have it right in front of me, but I can get it to uh, to Rick and Steve. But when we did this, um, we went to an organization that redistributes books. It was started by a bunch of high schoolers here in Los Angeles, and um, they will um, ship books out both to schools that are under-resourced, but also not just here in California, but around the, the country. And um, my, from when I worked with them this summer, they won't take any books that are annotated. They have to be in fairly good condition, but they will take both fiction, nonfiction, um, all ages, and um, they will even take textbooks. So um, so I will get their name for you, but that that is what I have done. I don't know if others in the group yeah. have any. Anyway, so- We can crowdsource it. Uh, and getting that information to me, how would you sure. wish to do that? Sure. I huh? will get it to Steve and Rick, and hopefully okay. they will get it to you. Okay. Thank you. All right. No problem. I appreciate, appreciate your presentation very much. Thank you. Thank you. What a great question, too. I think we're all in that position. Um, Rick? Yeah. Um, Allison, thank you very much, and I, I apologize for the technical issues and stuff, but... Um, I, um, Rick, why do you think I had you running the, the, the PowerPoint? <laughs> if you had left it to me, we would still be on the first slide. So it's totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys are lucky you just didn't see a cartoon or something. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was really impressed when, and it hit me when you said that um, 
one of the things that that I think that, and I'm paraphrasing that you learned from um, reading and, and and especially the young age is the idea of compassion and empathy, and yeah. that in a way that is being attacked in these book bans. That is something that is a a wall that. Um, that needs to happen in order for that divide um, to to occur, where where people don't want to cross the uh, um, the realm of of understanding the other. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think also another thing is the idea of of, of excelling, which is being able to. Um, perform something or learn something or or be or do something beyond the realm of what you originally thought was possible because with that you start to understand that not only is that true for you it's true for others no matter what kind of background that they have so um yeah I, i i think that's where the heart of it is i'm you know we my wife and i live in pomona which is near uh, the Chino Valley School District, which is having their the, the same issue too. Um, so um, I wanted to ask you about uh, specifically, and, and it's a personal question, just like Phil. Uh, I'd like to be involved in 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 being able to talk to the school district when they have open meetings, but I'm not. I don't have a kid in there. Right. Uh, um, we have two cats, but they're not going to school. Um, and we, not uh, yeah, not yet. And, and <laughs> um, we, uh, uh, we want to be able to, to make an impact there. So uh, I didn't know if you had any yeah. thoughts on that. So um, I do. So I so um, appreciate that. And I do think it's, um, you know, this idea of, of growing that, that empathy and compassion are, um, human traits that need to be cultivated you know study after study shows that children might be born born with this kind of feeling of empathy or compassion but that it can be quickly kind of you know by age five or so when they start to it is some something shifts and the idea that um books are a way in which, you know, so I'm thinking about, so, so this book, I, this is what I do. So this book is um, All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. George M. Johnson identifies as a queer Black author, writer here. He, they live here in um, the Los Angeles area. It's a memoir. It's kind of like a memoir. And I have to say, there's a lot, and this is one, by the way, that gets banned all the time because they say it's pornographic because George writes about their first experience um, sexual experience, which was a, which was um, a non-consensual sexual experience. Um, but they also talk about their coming of age. And um, um, George, I've had the opportunity to be on panels with George. Um, and um, George talks about the fact that they wrote it because when they were growing up, they didn't, they would go and they would read books and they never saw themselves in a book. They never saw their story in a book. They never saw their story, what they were feeling in a book and that they wrote it so that that others wouldn't feel that way, that others could at least read that. And when they were struggling with, well, who am I and what am I? Am I some freak? They would have something to go by. Um, And and I and and, you know, that's not just written for the student or the person that's having those feelings. It's also written for people like me who can't understand what it, I am not a black queer person and I don't know what that lived experience is, but I read George's words and I have a deeper level of understanding for George and I have a deeper level of compassion and empathy. And so, you know, I, I think that can't be, um, you know, I, I do think like that is the real loss here. Um, I am trying to find in real time, but then I'm, um, not doing it. Um, we have a tip sheet online about what you can do um, to um, what you can do to now I'm just going to like start populating the chat because I'm trying to and I'm a very bad multitasker. So in the chat, first of all, that's something on a Scambia, but um, about like a tip sheet of like, I need to I want to go to my school board meeting. What do I say? What can I say at my school board meeting? Um, we do think that the, you know, that the 
most important thing that you can do is it is this, this, you know, something where around like 70 to 80% of Americans oppose book bans, but it is this vocal minority that comes out. Um, and, um, you know, uh, so we need a vocal majority in the response to come out to their book ban, to their school board meetings when these um, issues are being um you uh, talked about and say, no, I stand for free expression. And by the way, if you want to um, mine the internet for moments of inspiration, mine the internet for some of the great conversation. I mean, there's this woman in Florida, her name, I got to find it, but she is 101 years old and she goes to her school board meeting and she talks about the fact that she had a spouse who died in World War II and he fought for freedom and she's here for him. And it is just the most inspiring, um, you know, it is just, you know, so so be that vocal majority and the other, you know, to the other end. And then I would also say, um, you know, this is a hyper local issue. And, um, and so we, we need to encourage people to know who is on their school board. And even in elections that seem, um, you know, they're not a federal election, it's not a big election, you know, the upcoming, you know, election, for instance, um, to find out if there are members of your school board who are up for election to find out what do they stand for? Where, who, by the way, funded them, um, you know, in Chino and Temecula and Huntington Beach. Um, it has been, a, um, sad, sad to say, it has been organized by the religious right, um, usually PACs that are funded by evangelical religious right mega churches um, have, have done a real intentional job of recruiting and getting into positions at school boards and city council levels, um, candidates that support their point of view. Um, that is most definitely the case in Temecula and in Huntington Beach. Um, and it's like they came in and the first thing they kind of attack is critical race theory issues. And then the next thing has to do with book banning. So we would encourage you to get out the word. We're partnering with um, Let America Read um, on a campaign and campaign for our shared future on a campaign to make sure people know that they're registered to vote and that they can understand uh, what the, who is on their school board. They can text READ, R-E-A-D, -E READ, to 26797, and that's anywhere in the country um, to learn more and to um, be activated. But I think like those are two really important things. No, thank you. And I also, in the chat, I put that tip sheet, so. Uh, thank anybody. you. You found it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Doc Ruby. Oh, good. You're showing yourself too. Can you introduce yourself at the same time? And then ask okay. Your... Well, one of the things I want to say is I understand where I am now because of um, where she said I was one of those people who was in the, in the library. And at the end, that's where if anybody wanted to find his child, I'd be in a library. And as an adult, I would go to, um, if any problems I had, I would go to a library. And I'd be one of the last people in the libraries before, you know, when they put me out. So I just, just, and right now, if I, if I show you here in the room, you'll see a file cabinet, which is supposed yeah. to be my bedroom. <laughs> Because and these are library file cabinets, so thank you very much. But the thing is, too, um, with the books and everything that I have, I, um, I, I, I love books, and so I've had a hard time regarding the audio books, which has kind of stopped me from reading, and I'm wondering, you know, what the difference is because I could take a book and just lay it down and you know, put it to go to sleep and wake up with it. And so I find that I have just kind of blocked myself from reading the current books. Um, and I'm grateful for what you're saying about the banning and everything. And, and Steve, also what you brought about uh, up about Bonn, I was there in the 50s. I was in Germany and um, I'd been in, you know, Bonn and, you know, all the different things. So, um, you know, and this has just been, um, this is why so, so many of these are very important to be played again. I'm also in a writing group 
And I, I want to pass this on to the writing group that I'm in regarding the band issues and everything and support you in this. So uh, I just want to let you know where I am and I appreciate where you are and the information. But I'm my basic thing now is currently is I'm a I'm a listening person, but you know, I don't want that to hurt me, my books. And Phil, I understand where you are regarding giving books away that you're not using, but I'm looking at the books and I you know, I love my books. I wake up looking yeah. at the books right now. So um yeah. but what what is it regarding the um audio that's come out now? Because that's kind of stopped me from reading. You're listening to more books than you are um, reading them. Is that what you're saying? Or you're saying there's not as many books available to you because they're they're all audio. No, I'm blocking myself from ah. re- the audio versus for right. me having a physical book and reading yeah. it. Look, I, you know, I am a... Um, I'm going to say that I'm a consumer. I'm an agnostic consumer of books. I I don't judge, you know, some people need the book, like the physical book. Some people love reading it on their Kindle or their, their iPad and they read the digital version. And some people listen to books. You know, I've, I've never been able to, um, I've never gotten into the listening part of books. It's just not my, you know, I know a lot of people, that's how they pass a commute. That's how they, you know, road trips, they listen to a lot of books. Um, To me, I I can do that for nonfiction. I can't do that so much for fiction, because I feel like part of the encounter for fiction is, um, is uh, creating the characters in your head, what you think they look like, what you think they sound like. Um, But that's just my own bias. But um, I would not say I certainly, I don't think Pen America takes a stance on how you consume uh, literature, uh, whether it's audio, digital, in the book form itself. I would say most writers will say they don't care how you do it as long as you buy it. Um, that's what matters to them. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I would, I would want people to have multiple access points. And by the way, you know, one of the ways that, uh, libraries are fighting book bans is um, there's a movement called Books Unbanned. Um, it was started at the Bro- Brooklyn Public Library. Um, it's in the Boston Public Library. It's in the Seattle Public Library and the Los Angeles County Libraries just adopted it um, with support from the LA County Board of Supervisors where a student anywhere can access an e-digital library card, a digital library card. So they don't have to be a resident of the county or the city, and that will allow them to access books um, that might have been taken off their library shelves where they live locally. Um, We think that's really important because um, free books are, it's really important that um, those who are most at risk for not having access to stories who can't just go to a bookseller and, and buy them, can't just order them on Amazon, um, can access them. But Phil, mm-hmm. you just walked away. And in the meantime, in the chat, I remembered the name of the organization that I use to give away our books. So I put that in the chat. It's called Bookworms Glo- Bookworm Global. And if you go to, it's a team, it's entirely team led organization. I know that I gave them about 10 baker's boxes full of books this summer. Some volunteer picked it up. And um, I'm, I'm glad to know they're, they're, they're being used um, in a good way now so yes and i want to thank you again and let you know that you're one of the 52 that i feel that need to just be kept because you know we we have you every year as speakers you know and so i figured 52 weeks as speakers uh, and i need to pass you on to other people that are ready to go ahead yeah yes thank you thank you uh, Steve, is your hand up again, or did you not take it down the first time? Uh, it is up again, and I'm happy to give way to new... No, nope. the stage is yours. A couple uh, gathering up a few things, uh, Allison. Uh, first of all, in the chat, I put in uh, the Southern California Library for uh, Social Studies and Research uh, on Vermont. Uh, I have donated, uh, as I packed up to leave L.A., uh, I donated a lot of 
uh, books to them. Uh, they have the same standards. They're looking for unmarked books, uh, which is tough for me because I keep a pen next to any book I read. Uh, but anyway, it's in there, uh, Phil. He stepped away, but uh, uh, everybody else. I'm trying please. to help Phil. We're all trying to help Phil, and Phil stepped away. I what know, are we going to do? I don't Phil know. Stepped out. Uh, by the way, we're happy to see Mrs. Lee has joined us. Uh, your mother. This my is a fa entire fan club. Yes, my entire fan club is watching me this morning. That's great. <laughs> family event which is just gorgeous and wonderful um i wanted when i sent out my article yesterday a friend responded to what extent are adults reading uh access being affected uh many of these book bands you were focusing on schools and children so uh uh i uh, in an earlier draft of that article pointed out that there's a UCLA study from their critical race theory that um, over 241 laws have been enacted restricting the teaching of critical race theory, the teaching of the 1619 project from the New York Times. Yeah. So the problem is widespread and goes beyond children's uh, reading. And I wanted to ask you, uh, based on Penn's research and, and uh, other uh, analysis, the extent to which the adult uh, population's access to ideas and reading are being restricted. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So Penn's area of focus, which, you know, every organization has people who are involved in lead your own organizations know you got to pick your lane. Um, but our area of focus when we are tracking book bans is really in the school libraries. The American Library Association, which is the professional association of librarians, does their own tracking of their libraries. Um, and certainly, you know, books that are being challenged or removed in school li in, in public libraries affects all, us all, right? Like even if it's in the YA section of a, of a library, when your library is being attacked, um, you know, certainly that impacts everyone, not just, you know, young readers. Um, so I think, you know, that is, you know, is data that you can go and you can take a look at in terms of what is happening in libraries around the country. But certainly, um, you know, beyond book banning, um, we do a lot of uh, work on educational censorship more broadly, which certainly, um, you know, conversations around the 1619 projects and conversations about race and, and, and many times, you know, race and ethnic identity um, issues that are being taught on campuses are not, it's not actually critical race theory. Critical race theory is a very defined legal theory that is mostly taught entirely in law schools, originated here at UCLA. And so a lot of times people will throw, oh, you're teaching critical race theory, when really what that is, is um, um, places, whether it's companies or communities are trying to have conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion. A lot of times that gets thrown, up, thrown about. So. Um, we do a lot of work on, on college campuses, um, a lot of work. Um, we have what's called the Champions of Higher Education, which is a group of former um, college and university presidents who've come together to identify that conversations around uh, free expression, um, issues around free expression are being, um, you know, really under attack. That's not just what what. Uh, professors are able to teach or how they teach, but um, what conversations are allowed to be had. Um, so this gets a little outside of the book banning purview of Penn, but certainly it gets into this idea of when you stand, you know, something I talked about at the very beginning, which is when you stand for a free expression, you stand for the importance of having difficult conversations and the real belief that our society and our democracy is benefited by robust debate. Um, and um, that means we don't believe in the heckler's veto. We don't believe, um, you know, we, we saw that up in Stanford. Um, you know, we do believe that that people should be, in, you know, as long as physical safety is not threatened in any way, um, that speakers should be allowed to convene wherever they're brought and, convert and, and say what they need to say. Again, we have an equal right to protest. We have an equal right to object. 
Um, but in a free society, um, we should be um, standing by that that principle, which is a hard, which as the ideas and the thoughts get more and more vicious, um, that is a hard principle sometimes to stand by. Thank you. Carol Francis? I, yeah. I uh, have the main questions, but I also have three very quick questions, one sentence question, one sentence answer. How do we access your visual presentation? Could you send it to yeah. Steve, the email to us? Um, how do we access Golden State Readers? They sound like a great group for us to talk with. And where and when is your event tomorrow? Okay, so, so many questions. So, yeah, um, before you get. So, um, we are, so first, the easy one, uh, the, um, the PowerPoint, Rick, you're welcome to share it with the group. There's, there's, you know, I have no problems with that being sent as an attachment. So you all can have access to that. Mm -hmm. um, our event on Monday, it's um, on Monday evening at Skylight oh. Books on Vermont, um, is with Justin uh, Torres. Um, if you go, I'm just going to put this in there. I can't, I don't have the ability to filter it while I'm there, but if you all go to just the Penn events calendar, uh, you ah. can just kind of scroll down and see that this has all of our events around the country. So you kind of have to like scroll, oh. scroll, scroll to get to it. Um, you'll see our event today. Um, but you, um, on the ninth, we're at um, Skylight Books on the Friday the 13th with Sophia Sinclair, we're at Reparations Club. Um, on the 17th, completely a little bit unrelated, but might, might be of interest, we're doing an event at Second Home in Hollywood on L.A. Noir with um, David Yolen. Um, and, um, and then I am doing an event on the 22nd of October at the uh, Museum of the Holocaust, Los Angeles, on book bands with two writers, um, Il Ilana K. Arnold, and um, who is the other one with, and Eric, um, sorry, let me just remember Eric's last name. Um, Sorry, um, Dr. Eric Cervini, um, who both of their books have been challenged and are both local writers. Um, and then I'm doing an event down at UC Irvine um, with a whole group of writers on the 25th. But all of those events are open to the public. Mm, I think all of those events are also free. So um, you know, just go to the event pages and, and find it. And we'd love to see you there. That's great. The and Golden, Golden State, State Readers. Readers, Golden State Readers. So Golden State Readers is like this. I've only found them. Um, they're they're graduates of our next gen. So it's very sweet because what happened is we had a bunch of students. We had a summer institute here in Los Angeles uh, with about thirty students who did the a week long uh, training. They came up with this idea as part of their their training they come up with a project they came up with this project right now it only lives on instagram so if you're not on instagram i can't really help you it doesn't exist beyond instagram it's kind of a um a, a, a sweet sort of thing but let me see if i can um find let's see if i can find something more than than that i will try and see if i can well let's keep talking and i'll i'll try and <laughs> i'll see if find i can it. take a look as well yeah yeah here let's see yeah. here we go this is i only have so sorry i'm not necessarily asking but i what i can find is a um um is a donor page for them because they're trying to raise funds but um, this is what I got. Hold on one second. I'm just going to copy their press release into the chat. So it'll be rather long, but, um, oh, it's too long. So I don't have, here we go. Here's the page on Instagram. There you go. And there's a link tree there. See, Rick, you're not the only one with a link tree. So you can go from there. Well, that's great. Well, my main question is about um, censorship uh, by p publishers and producers. 
In other words, mm. if the you can't get your work published because mm-hmm. of the producers not wanting your work. I, I'm notice you mentioned a program for emerging writers. I don't know if that's open to seventy five year old writers who are still trying to emerge. Oops. And yeah. the other question very quickly is that you opened with talking about pen um chapters all over the world and said the first ones you mentioned is there's the pen Palestine and the pen Israel. Mm-hmm. Which mm-hmm. oh man, I'd love to know are they working together or um are are they will, helping Yeah. Yeah. They are not, my understanding is they were at one time working together and then not surprising for the moment we are in. They are not, um, they're, they're not currently working together, which is sad, but they are working Uh what I would say parallel to one another. Like they are working for a parallel, um, you know, there, it is all writers and academics and, um, they might have some fundamental disagreements, but they actually have some very fundamental agreements on, on, on human rights and humanity. And so they're, they're, they're trying as it is not possible for them, given the current political situation for them to work together, but they are um, working in parallel universes is how I would describe it right now. Okay. Thank you for your work. Um, for, for, just so you know, I put um, into the chat based on, you know, so I, I talked about the fact that we did research. We actually just published a, a report called Book Lash um, on the cancellation of books um, and and the cancellation of, um, of projects. Um, we've done that for literary works. We're, we're working on research that will do that for um, screen and television as well. Um, we've also done works on, you know, um, race equity, um, you know, diversity in publishing and what that, what that pipeline looks like and what the challenges are there. Um, and, um, Emerging Voices, I won't get into it, but Emerging Voices is a national, um, fellowship program, um, that pairs writers and mentors around the country. We will be doing, um, in 2024, in 2025, we'll be doing two week-long local workshops here for about a cohort of about 15 writers. Um, Come back to the website and I can can let you know we'll be opening up the applications for those in December and January with workshops in June and December of next year. If somebody could just copy from the the chat, uh, just the whole chat. Yeah. For those of us who are um, on phone, I'd love to get the, uh, everything that was put in the chat. So uh, I can Thank do you. that for you. Thanks, Rick. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, was that all your question, Carol Francis? Yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. Maggie? <laughs> all right. Um, I'll take my hand down later. <laughs> Deal with that. Oh, I can do that. Okay. I have, I don't know how to put this clearly, but I do have conversations with people who are still on the Dick and Jane kind of comprehension level. Adults. <laughs> they might be able to read the words, but they can't get the nuance. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> And but what's happened to me is I think well they're just stupid, and they're never going to catch up. And um, so I feel hopeless about these are friends that I've known you know since my twenties who are saying things like you know they just a minute bare minimum of they've listened to something on Fox. <laughs> so right. what I'm saying is they don't have the background to have any kind of in depth thing. They probably haven't even read anything that Martin Luther King wrote. I mean it's. It's the lack of a background. Yeah. So what what is your group? How is your group addressing that issue? So, um, um, you know, I find with um, individuals that 
for whom the empathy, the compassion, the stories change lives, like, you know, that sort of stuff doesn't really resonate. The thing that does resonate is this idea of should another, do you want another parent or grandparent or member of the community making decisions for you and your family? Like at, at its very core, that's what this is is um, you take away a book and you take away the right, your right to make that decision for yourself and your family. So if you get to just the very kind of libertarian aspect of it, and sometimes for those folks, that's actually what resonates, which is the this idea <clears throat> of this movement mean, it takes, you know, Moms for Liberty and, and the organizations like them say, we are doing this for our children. We are a parents' rights organization and we are advocating for the rights of our children. We don't want our children exposed to this, this you know, horrific material that's going to trauma, you know, whatever it's going to do to them. And, you know, my response back to that typically is a, great, you can do that for your children, but you don't get to decide that for my children. And I am going to put my faith and educators, librarians, folks who are professionally trained to determine what is, what is like, there's not a book on a shelf. What I also say is there's not a book on the shelf of any library, school library, public library, that didn't get there through a very structured process. It is it, Books just don't appear on library shelves. That's why we can't give all our books away to libraries because they don't just appear on library <laughs> shelves. And so, you know, like there's an intentionality and, and there's a curation and there's, um, um, you know, research and, and, and uh, you know, things that I am not an expert in that make those determinations. And some person doesn't get to just override all of that not just for themselves and their own families, but for you and for everyone else in the community. You don't mm -hmm. like a book, don't read a book, but you don't have the right to take away the right to read from someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I would say. Don't even get into the other stuff. Just do that. And I think mm -hmm. it's a pretty compelling argument. So and that is that, just a great note to, sorry, carry on Maggie, sorry. So. I don't understand. What if then a teacher chooses to, because we all have a right to choose, that they want the class to read a David Duke book and study it? Okay, well, so first of all, teachers don't get to just decide what's in their curriculum. All curriculums are approved, have a process of approval, not just at the local school, you know, at the local school level and is guided by principles that a school board puts out. I mean, even Escondido, the thing that's so surprising about Escondido is we did a lot of deep research into, well, what's their policy when a book gets challenged? And there's nothing in their stated publicly accessible policy that says, well, what we do is we close all of our libraries to do an audit. Right. And so, you know, and by the way, like, I, you know, I might not want a David Duke book to be read, but, you know, like, it's it's one of those things where it's like, is Mein Kampf in libraries? Yes, right. it's it's in libraries. And is that is and they are there because they meet a historical, cultural, they meet a they meet right. a standard. Right. Um I don't think, you know, it's like someone doesn't, um, just as I don't think that someone becomes gay because they read a book on LGBTQ themes, right. I don't believe, I don't believe that ideas are dangerous. We don't believe that ideas are dangerous. We believe that the restriction of ideas are, is dangerous. And so that's what I would say, uh, you know. I mean, so, so maybe the David Duke book would be a good idea to explore it if and say, you know, this through, is the kind of thing that they are banning and we need to look at that in a, as a country. Look, for the record, in Utah, when the law passed in Utah, we were waiting for mm -hmm. it to happen. Um, 
somebody challenged and it was the Bible was banned. Like, I mean, it was the opposite of probably what the what the people who were banning books wanted. But if you think about the Bible, it has sexual violence. It has, you know, it, it has everything you can imagine that actually need, you know, it has grief, it has violence, it has, um, it has all the stories. And so, um, so someone was like, okay, you want to ban X, Y, or Z? Well, I'm going to challenge the Bible. And by the standards of the legislation, the Bible was removed from classrooms. And that, you know, while it's funny to think about is actually, you know, kind of the point, which is, is from David Duke to the Bible, to everything, to Mein Kampf, to the books that uplift, um, you know, we want a free and open and robust discourse. And we also believe that we should trust the teachers and the librarians in the process by which um, things are determined and that one individual or a small group of individuals does not have the right to determine um, what we get to read, what we get to write, and what we get to learn. I'll make it really quick. Uh, I One thing that I read that I thought really resonated with me was the idea that if uh, you're going to ban, try to ban a book for a whole district or a whole library, <clears throat> that you should be able to write a report on the book and have it graded by a, a teacher in the district. <laughs> And I, you know, I, I think that handles several different issues. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Yes, you would, you would all be appalled about how easy it is to get a, get a book challenged, you know, um, or, um, or um, removed from shelves. That is part of the Escambia case, which is they didn't even follow their own process. They just, they just pulled them. That, that's what amazed me about the Amanda Gorman thing, because it's a short poem. It's not that yeah. long to read. And it seems like the person that tried to ban it in, in Florida didn't even read it. I mean, no, she clearly had not. She admitted it. She in, 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 in news reports, she admitted she had not read the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I've learned a lot. I think we all have. It's just been an incredible presentation. It's rather a sad one in lots of ways. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Allison, so much. Uh, I was yeah. going to turn to uh, Andy at the end uh, oh, and, and applaud him and your mother. Um, I, this thank group you, Steve, for that wonderful reflection. Yes, oh, that, that reflection. Yes, it brought back memories for me yeah. <laughs> in Germany. Uh, and, and, Allison, the group knows that at this moment, I usually tell new speakers that they are now card-carrying members of ICUJP, but I feel you've been carrying our card next to your library card uh, for many, many years. Uh, <laughs> please give an extra warm hug to Ken and your family. Uh, you're doing extraordinary work. You've got to know Me that. Too. I know you wake up every day to do this work. We are so grateful for it. Uh, we will stay in touch with you. Uh, Rick and I will work together to uh, be sure that the entire group uh, has the materials you've referred mm -hmm. to. Uh, this entire program has been recorded and will be posted and made available. And uh, we want to thank you, Allison, so much.